Great, excellent. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for having me uh, at IndieWay. I will get started with a deck and then I'm happy to answer some questions afterward. Uh, so basically, this particular presentation is titled Game Design to Heal Self, Society, and Community. It's 9 a.m. here in Miami, so if I'm a little slow, I apologize. All right, so let's get started. And really the focus here is um, partly informed by one of my older games called Healer, uh, which is about sort of healing um, as, a, as a game mechanic. So I'm a professor, game designer, developer, artist, and author. Uh, I have directed two academic game studios, so game studios centered within an academic institution. Uh, and they've completed just shy of a million dollars US over four, four and a half years um, uh, in contracts and, and, um, and grant work. And it's, the work was done for a variety of clients uh, across the globe, uh, including these. And those are some of my students in the corner. Uh, and I've also been a solo game designer, uh, developer, and artist. So I've been an indie game designer in each of these areas. Uh, and I've designed, developed, and released a variety of games like the one shown here. Uh, some games are sort of artistic, some games are uh, very commercial. And I've been awarded for that work over the years as well uh, from a variety of sort of industry and academic venues. Uh, I've done a lot of commercial game dev as well. So the sort of positions, what I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you in a minute. Uh, and some of those have ranked in the top 10, top 20, top 100 on um, Apple's App Store, uh, like these games. Uh, and others have been largely educational games focused on um, sort of teaching people languages or teaching people uh, about art or other topics. Uh, I've also received a few career awards uh, for the work that I've done, um, like the Inventor Innovator Award, and uh, from an organization I have a lot of respect for, the Games for Change uh, Festival, I received the 2019 uh, Vanguard Award winner, uh, as well as the Higher Education Video Game Alliance Fellow in 2022. I do a lot of exhibitions and curating, uh, so I actually do uh, create art shows uh, around games. Uh, and these are sometimes traditional art exhibits, like the one shown here, and sometimes they're large festivals, like the Smithsonian American Art Museum Sam Arcade, which we ran from 2017 to 2019, um, or co-ran. Uh, I've also written a variety of books, uh, chapters, and articles throughout the years, um, more than 75, uh, including a book, uh, Doing Things with Games, Social Impact Through Play, uh, love and Electronic Affection, which is really a design primer about how we portray love in games, and most recently, Black Game Studies, which focuses on um, the work of people of the African diaspora. Uh, I've been teaching games for more than a decade, uh, probably closer to two decades at this point, at a variety of institutions uh, across the country um, in the U.S., uh, including my university, American University, and the University of Miami, uh, which are the three of the five uh, that I've taught at. Uh, they're all top 20 programs as ranked by the Princeton Review, and I co-founded the games program at uh, Miami University. Uh, I was the founding director of the game studio and lab at American University, and I'm currently directing the MFA, the Master of Fine Arts Interactive Media, at the University of Miami in Florida. Uh, I also serve as the vice president for Higher Education Video Game uh, Alliance, and as uh, I formerly served as a board member for the Global Game Jam. I'm a huge fan of jams uh, and really encourage everyone to do them as often as they can. I and myself have organized more than nine game jams uh, and I've been uh, uh, basically inspiring people to do digital and analog game jams. Uh, I've also done a bunch of themed jams. So this is one we did around news that I thought was a lot of fun, current topics and games. Uh, and I judge a variety of these uh, events, uh, including the Complexity Jam, as well as Games for Change, Annual Awards, Indiecades um, uh, Festival, and the IGF, the Independent Games Festival, all of which would be venues I'd always encourage someone who's doing indie games to consider. I also speak often uh, about games uh, and the power of play, uh, including at uh, industry events like GDC, so I'll be at GDC in uh, two weeks. Uh, and I speak at a number of institutions that are widely respected in the U.S. and uh, globally. And I also speak uh, on television, kind of championing the power and benefit of games as well. Uh, you might have seen there's a recent documentary on Monopoly uh, that I was just in, um, just a few moments, maybe five, ten minutes of the one hour documentary, but still fun all the same. And so that's to kind of position what I've been doing. Uh, and typically at this point, people are sort of like, how did I get here? 
And um, I've actually been making games for more than 20 years off and on. Uh, that was one of my first games, Super Mystery House on a five and a quarter diskette. Uh, and I was actually a very sick child. And so um, one of the things I did was I played games as a sick child. And when I was in the hospital, they rewarded us by telling us if we got a blood test, we could spend five minutes playing this game, this head-on game. And I absolutely loved it. I was like five, six years old. And it was the best thing on the planet for me. And so I really did fall in love with games at a young age. But we were also poor and I was an only child. So um, we didn't have a computer. We didn't have the means to make these games. Uh, and so I kind of taught myself by reading magazines like Nibble. Uh, and then I made my own games because I couldn't afford to buy games. Uh, and then I could bring those games to uh, the open computer labs and the libraries and uh, use them. And so I really just kind of learned about um, data storage and these sorts of things through this magazine, um, learned about variables and then made it my own. And I made my own using paper at first and then moved on to plotting scenes in graph paper and then programming them um, line by line later. I was a kid, I didn't really understand some of the uh, math to do it. So I just plotted them individually. And I really did make a bunch of um, graphical choose your adventure games, um, and I tried to sell them locally to my friends and to people in the community. And it's sort of like the original indie. Uh, and I was always excited about doing things like coming up with formulas for scoring and um, kind of learning about drawing and how I could turn that into um, computer art and make my own little logos and that sort of thing. And generally, I was just being playful with computers. It was really kind of fun for me to do. And I think that we should in, in, like sort of embrace the fact that computers themselves can be playful. So I found comfort in games at that age, and I still find comfort in games. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that there is comfort in games. And so the reason there's comfort in games is because it's really about play, and there's comfort in play. Um, play from the literature, from um, uh, an academic perspective, helps us get perspective. Um, it's one of the ways that we kind of take a step back and appreciate a moment, but it's also a way that we explore potential moments. And so it's an opportunity, play is an opportunity to imagine our actions as scaled, um, as in Shadow of the Colossus, or to find comfort in the smallest decisions like this indie game unpacking, which is really quite charming for its simplicity um, and really kind of a, um, just a comfort uh, experience. Play is also the work with which we want to engage. And so um, one of the champions, or one of the reasons I champion play is because play is work, but it's work we want to do. And so as we both play in creating games and play games um, by being players, I think it's important to recognize that it is work, but it's work we, with which we want to engage. So play, just, play is kind of the magic motivator, uh, like this little dream, believe, achieve uh, Zelda mean um, as sort of a reminder of that. And it's also the way that we want to get things done. So the reason I titled my first book, Doing Things with Games, is because there's a lot we can do with games, from changing people's perspectives to educating them to just inspiring them to feel great about the day. So it's also the way that we can easily see another, um, see another and ourself. So um, it's a way of looking at ourselves through gameplay and saying, oh, what if I were a knight? What if I were um, uh, lost on a, on a planet? These sorts of things. And understanding, for example, in the game Florence, featured in the middle here, um, how, uh, how love feels uh, and how we can experience uh, another person's love. But also play is a means of envisioning a better future. And so um, as part of the sustainable uh, development goals, you have people making climate change games that really do help us see what, what we could do to improve the world. And so it's really, uh, I think, often misunderstood that games are about escaping, when really it's not merely about escaping from our present or past, it's about envisioning a new future and, and, a, and a future that we hope for. So one of the core questions that usually comes up at this point is sort of, but how, how do we do this? And so I'm gonna kind of unpack the benefits of gameplay to you and explain um, some of the ways that I've uh, helped others understand this. And so the core to gameplay is um, really just the way that we understand the how. So if we were to look historically at the literature that's been produced over the last hundred years, we know from anthropology, from sociology and psychology and others, 
that generally play forms two purposes. Play is practice and it's laboratory. It is a means for us practicing something, anything in a safe environment. And it's also a means for us to explore, to uh, experiment like in a laboratory within safe confines. So um, it supports practice in things like life skills, like seeing this cat who's actually trying to um, practice hunting, right? We understand that a lot of activities that happen with children and that happen developmentally happen as a means for uh, encouraging practice uh, of real world skills, but also for informal experimentation, like balancing rocks on the beach, or finding solutions to um, physics problems through Lego physics or playing with construction in Minecraft. These are all opportunities to practice finding solutions. And we know that then in, in a military context or in a, an emergency context that we have people who practice under situational understanding through games, um, the kind of role play that we see there, or just to role play to help develop comfort as in children playing doctor to get used to having to go to the doctor and not getting nervous about it. So the idea is that games, as I've often said before, are structured play. Uh, that basically the difference between a game and a play is the amount of structure that you apply to play. And so when I talk about games as structured play, I typically describe them as practice, experimentation, and understanding. So games are structured play to practice, experiment, and understand. But I'm gonna take a different tact here in this talk and actually talk about how games are also structured play to heal. And so I'll kind of unpack that for you. Um, they're kind of an opportunity to heal self, as in uh, the VR product Trip, which is really about um, practicing uh, healthy mental health through uh, VR. Uh, so Calm Reimagined is their, their core slogan. Or Healing Self in games like Concrete Genie, which is really about finding um, sort of mental health through art practice. Uh, or Healing Community, as Half the Sky Movement, um, the game attempts to do or healing society as the monopoly version of structural inequality and structural racism occurs in inequality-opoly. So it's kind of a game, a board game that reflects on um, systemic inequality and how we might combat that. There's also more to games than just the power of bringing us together, which is often raised in this context of healing. And I don't want to diminish that. There's clearly benefit in bringing us together, but there's more than that. Um, it's an opportunity to design experiences that embrace playfulness. So I think Octodad is a really fun example of that. If you're unfamiliar with the game, it's basically an octopus trying to masquerade as a dad um, and trying to do mundane things playfully as, a, as, a, as an octopus who doesn't quite walk like a dad and doesn't quite um, do things like grill like a dad. But playfulness... Um, that's actually useful in life is the thing that really excites me. And so um, if you look at my own path, as I shared it with you, it may seem like a linear path. This kid who absolutely loves games ends up at places like GDC speaking about games, and that's all I did. But the reality looks far more like this. And this real path is actually a kind of mess to some people. But to me, it's actually just a playful path. It's not a mess at all. And so that playful path is really about um, recognizing that our lives are not always that direct. It's not, I went somewhere and I just went down a single path. Instead, what happens is we have all these sort of, um, I don't know, learning moments, these experimentations. So I was a banking intern and I was excited about banking for a little while, but the problems weren't interesting enough for me. And then I went to finance and then I said, I wasn't really interested in that. And I eventually went to industrial supply and web development. And somehow I found my path to games. And so I also highlight that because I think some folks think that, um, that the world of games is quite linear. And many of the professional developers and designers I know are coming from other areas. And then they move into games because there's something about games that really grabs them. And that's true of me too. Um, the sort of path to being a game professor as I am now was not a linear one in any way, but all of these experiences helped me sort of playfully understand how games work and to actually be a better designer. Um, so it's to emphasize this idea that in reality, there was no linear path. Um, and that path, the reason I keep using the term playful path is because there's a really charming book I'd encourage anyone who's trying to figure out their own path in life to take a look at. It's um, now past Bernie DeCoven, Bernie DeCoven, 
uh, created this book called Playful Path. Um, and when I look at my reality as a playful path, I like this idea where he basically emphasizes the notion that um, the book itself serves as a collection of ideas and tools to help us bring our playfulness back into the open. Uh, basically, when we find ourselves forgetting the life of the game or the game of life, it's a resource and it's um, completely free to you. Uh, I think it's a good resource for anyone sort of trying to figure out what am I going to do in this indie game world? Uh, but ultimately, whenever I sort of get stuck, I remind myself to try and play the playful, the playful path, to recognize that there are opportunities to be playful and that playfulness is part of ideation, it's part of experimentation, it's part of um, finding solutions. And so I encourage anyone to embrace experimentation and practice in all of their work um, to kind of recognize that sometimes there are happy accidents and happy accidents can produce really interesting things. And so you might be surprised and entertained by the outcome if you engage safely, but playfully. Uh, and so what do you do when you actually fail at a game? Well, you just keep trying. And I think sometimes in life, it's hard to remember that. But if you think of life playfully, then you just keep grinding at it and you grind at it until you're really good at it. Um, so you pick it up and try again. When you drop that ball, you just keep trying. And so I think this is true of life. And I think what happens is you can do some really uh, amazing things when you're playful uh, and playful safely. So in games, we get to be playful safely and we get to experiment in a relatively no cost environment. And then as we become indie game designers and developers, we're still experimenting in a marketplace. We have no idea what's gonna work, but we actually do keep trying until we get it quite right. So I think that games are safe by design. We have this idea that we talk about often that a game world basically is opposed to the rest of the world. It's a safe space that we create um, to experiment, to play. And so the rest of the world, the dark area in this diagram um, is not necessarily safe. There are real risks in the real world. And so what I think is great about game design is that we have all these other worlds left to explore and create, other safe spaces, other play spaces to create. And so I encourage everyone, um, which may sound funny, to make a bad game. And I encourage you not to make one bad game, but to make lots of bad games, because I've made lots of bad games and I've learned from them. I've actually learned more from my bad games than I have my good games. And so there are loads of games I've discarded that you'll never see in my collection, that you won't see on my website, that I won't talk about generally, but I'm sharing with you candidly to remind you that it's okay. You experiment, you learn from this kind of design. And so I've, I've thrown away this health insurance critique game I've thrown away this game where you were wrecking ball. I've thrown away this game where you were fish trying to find the school and stay with the school. Um, I've thrown away a game about aging. I've thrown a away a game that was sort of a rhythm tapping game. Um, and I've thrown away lots and lots of other games, but I learned a lot from them. And the quintessential example in this that I'm, I'm guessing some of you have already heard before is that you should do things like make 10 not so great games uh, like Rovio did because it took them 51 or so unsuccessful game launches to launch one of the most profitable franchises in recent history. Uh, and so it was number 52 that really got them there. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that as you uh, struggle through your own game design and sometimes things are gonna be great and sometimes they're not gonna be great and that's okay. Find an opportunity to learn regardless. And so I really do believe in iterative design. I think that iterative design is the way to go. I think it's the way that we learn. And I do believe that we learn more from our failure than we do our success. And so um, it's okay to fail. It's great if you don't fail, but um, too, many, too many successes don't teach you nearly as much as a couple of failures. So um, I'll admit in any, any context that game making is not easy. Anyone who tells you it's easy is selling you something and I wouldn't trust them, um, but it's certainly wonderfully satisfying. And it's that wonderfully satisfying part that gets me up every morning and I go ahead and make more games. Um, I often think of game making like playing the piano and that you've got to find the joy in practice, not just in the one moment you get it right. And so it's the practice of game design that should be really fulfilling for you. And you will recognize that mistakes will happen. I always have a gratuitous pet or animal in every slide deck I have. So there's a gratuitous pet. Um, and I encourage you to find the joy in practice. So um, I think mistakes are really just opportunities to learn. Uh, and so I encourage you to, to make those mistakes. And this is one of the reasons that I absolutely love game jams. I love game jams because they are an opportunity, as I've written in this particular paper, understanding the difference between hackathons and game jams, that game jams are like playing music. They're an opportunity to get with other people and just jam. 
Um, and so the designer is like the singer, the developer is like the drummer, the artist is like the guitarist. And I apologize, I couldn't come up with a with someone with a bass. But generally, it's like a rock band, and you all have your part, and you all just play together. And it's great that maybe you're not normally a singer, but you're going to be a singer this time, or you're not normally a drummer, but you're going to be a drummer another time. It's one of the reasons that I, I've gotten relatively good at being a designer, a developer, and artist, and doing solo game development is because sometimes I'm a developer, sometimes a designer, sometimes I'm an artist. So I really do think jamming is a great way to play with making um, games, and I think it's really a useful way to do so. And I also think it's a great way to work together, practice working together and learn in a low cost environment. It's that same theme that I'm talking about where it's sort of like a game world is a safe environment, a jam is a safe environment. You're committing 48 hours, building something. If it doesn't go well, it feels a whole lot better than if you spent six, six months doing it and then discovered that it didn't go as well. So over the years, I've helped a variety of organizations embrace this kind of play. So I, I worked with the US's National Cancer Institute on data visualization as it might intersect with games and gameful, playful design. Uh, I've also worked with uh, the National Institute of Mental Health on um, opportunities to create games that actually function as treatments for mental health games. Um, with others. Uh, I've also worked on games that require problems that require the power of play. So uh, the idea is that there are some really tough problems that need something really tough, really supportive of practice, really supportive of experimentation. And so this is one of those games. It was basically a game to tell to help assess whether or not people knew what to say given a certain context, a really kind of fun um, problem to handle through games. But it's also hard problems like identifying fact from fiction and how that becomes a systemic problem over um, the long term. So factitious was a kind of Tinder for news where you swiped right if you thought it was real and left if you thought it was a fake article um, or understanding things like immigration policy. Uh, or just helping people understand that games themselves and gameful experiences are not just about playing for escape they're actually about playing with purpose. And so sometimes people don't realize that this old game, Shoots and Ladders or Snakes and Ladders, was originally designed as a kind of um, uh, purposeful game. It was designed as a pur purposeful game to help people understand the risks of vice and virtue. So if you took a vice, then you slid back down the snake and you were falling back and away from sort of enlightenment. Uh, and if you embraced a virtue, then you could climb faster. And so many of the games we play, both board games and um, uh, digital games, have these kinds of purposes baked into them, some explicitly and some less explicitly. But ultimately, the idea is to remind people that games excite us, that games help us foster community, and that games keep players engaged. So games like Wordle, uh, or if you're unfamiliar with this game, it's basically uh, a derivation of a um, European um, egg game that families would normally play where you balance an egg and you try to knock the egg out of someone's hand. They're holding it in a spoon. But this version is a digital version of it. And it's really just kind of a fun community, playful experience. Um, and other games do similar things. So uh, sometimes it's about participating in a global community like World Bowl, uh, or it's joining global communities of play, playing alongside others, cooperatively with others like Animal Crossing. But ultimately, I want to remind you that it's not only about playing with each other, it's playing to support each other. So if you're unfamiliar with Kind Words, which is less of a game and more of a sort of playful environment, uh, it's explicitly a place to kind of share nice supportive thoughts um, in a lo-fi chill beats environment, uh, really kind of a charming experience, or agree playing to cope with loss. So this is about, um, this is a game that is designed to um, sort of elicit the same kind of emotions and experiences that one would feel uh, through metaphor uh, with losing a loved one. Uh, and there's also the sort of general experience, the playfulness that happens in jamming with other people, uh, just trying to solve a problem cooperatively in building a game. So generally, I always like to encourage people to recognize that we are stronger as an indie community. And so it's great to work with each other, um, not necessarily in competition with each other. Uh, and I remind people that indie game makers can actually shape experiences like no others. Uh, the idea that we get people to play and practice the worlds we build for hours, I think, is really important and effective. Uh, and 
as a in a, in a, you actually have more freedom and smaller budgets than um, other people. So if you were to compare yourself to a AAA company, you have a lot at stake if you're running a giant franchise. But as an indie, you you have a smaller budget and you have fewer stakeholders, but that means you actually have more freedom. Uh, a lot of times you can just kind of do something crazy and see how it works. Make a game about a duck. Maybe it'll sell. Maybe it won't. It's fine. And I think that's actually really um, liberating and it feel, really feels free. Uh, I've been under uh, larger budgets and I have to say it's when you have no budget that you have a lot of autonomy and a lot of choice. Uh, so I encourage indies always to be wild and embrace play and to take risks like the Untitled Goose Game. Uh, because there really is this, this, this is the spirit of indie. It's the wild idea that Sony might not have uh, or Nintendo might not have embraced, but now that they see it and you built it, they go, oh, wow, cool. Actually, yes, we will buy that. And you're unburdened by the expectations of the 44th Call of Duty. And this is a fake. There isn't a 44th Call of Duty, but there's always this sort of um, when you're stuck in a franchise, you're limited more and more. And limitations can help, but they also um, can be burdens. So the real secret to games that heal is not really a secret at all. It's actually just the secret of play. And here what I'm showing is a um, game called Big Huggin that I produced more than 10 years ago, the very indie. The idea was that you hug this giant teddy bear that's in his hands to move him on screen. And so that hug was part of um, my experimentation with like, what does it mean to have a fluffy thing as your um, means for controlling the game instead of a hard piece of plastic that we always have? And there are also other games that help us um, see the world differently. So this is Terra Nil, I think one of the sort of it games of the year in the indie space for me. Um, it's about reclaiming a wasteland and building a environmental future that is aware of climate change and embraces the utility of um, climate technology. Uh, so building a better, greener world um, from nothing, which is atypical sometimes in indie games. We tend to uh, deal with an apocalypse by building more apocalyptic product, but in this case we do something else, um, or to build something together that's complex, like let's build a zoo, kind of a simple little indie game, um, another world builder, but this time we're building a zoo and monetizing it and um, doing all those kind of fun, goofy things. So when I tell people that I was really passionate and excited about games, I emphasize that I wasn't escaping uh, when I was playing games. Uh, I wasn't trying to find some other world. What I was doing was actually hoping. I was hoping um, for something new and interesting. And that's what really brought me into games was this opportunity to sort of hope for a new future. Uh, and I think most people who are into, into games are really about hoping for a more playful future. And I've got sort of all the folks um, here, all of these images are kind of that first generation of indie games that changed the world, right? Braid, Journey, Super Meat Boy. Um, Fez. And I think those are still super resonant games, games that helped remind us of all the potential. Uh, it's as though they demarcated a space in, in the world that we then lit up and realized there's so much more we could do. And so generally when I emphasize it, it's sort of like we're hoping to explore other spaces like in Sable. We're hoping to imagine a better world like Terra Nil. We're hoping and healing um, uh, and looking for sort of reasons to keep playing like games like Figment. They, they just give us something to get excited about, um, even when we're kind of sad and, and may not may not have that. So that's it. Um, that's all I have. Uh, I wanted to give you a chance to ask any questions, make myself accessible. Uh, hopefully that was useful, maybe motivational. Um, yeah. And I'll stop screen sharing so I can be on a, on a big screen for you. I can, I can see the clapping. Thank you. I don't know if I can hear it, but. <laughs> There's a question. Great. And it's kind of a cross of the game of the game. So I can picture only the last picture of the game of the and maybe it's play and impact on our um, everyday lives. Very from our homes, streets, the urban texture. And um, right now, when we look at both sides of this development on 
the game and it always has a little bit of profit and entertainment and um, on architecture side it's about design so thinking about the future would you like would you see a new um, project area study area resulting from the um, developments and how would you um, link this with the healing for the presentation I could only hear a portion of that, but I think I heard mentions of architecture and the intersection of play. Was that the question? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, yeah, so I actually, uh, for years, have been teaching as part of uh, my game design courses, uh, a kind of um, the novelty, we'll say, of people who use architectural spaces as play. So um, people who are uh, doing things like parkour, uh, and reading an environment that is not explicitly designed for play as a playful experience, as an opportunity to play. Um, I'm also a huge fan of uh, embracing smart city technology in order to engage in playful use of space. Um, there's a really good set of observations made uh, by Jane McGonigal and Ian Bogost from um, many years ago about the way that we can reclaim space through play. Uh, they had a um, sort of a, what was the game called? Something like, um, basically it was an alternate reality game. Um, oh, uh, Cruel to be Kind, in which you would go around a street and give people compliments and kind of accrue compliment points uh, and then make this sort of ma this mass of people um, through compliment giving. And I thought it was a nice way to sort of encourage people to be social and engage with their environment. Uh, but I do think there's plenty of opportunity for playful design in architecture. And I think there are some precedents, but a lot more space to be explored. Does that kind of answer the question? I can only hear a portion of it. The um, audio was cutting in and out a lot. And um, about the future of this um, this area of study, um, would you see a new um, practice coming out of it? Did, did you? Did you? Oh, there's a lot of feedback and echo. So yeah, we're solving that right now. Okay. Uh, uh, she's asking that if do uh, do you think about any uh, new area uh, of practice, right? Uh, for the can, can you repeat your question so I can. Sorunu tekrarlar mısın? Ben buradan söyleyeceğim. About the future of this development, um, she's asking both game development and architecture actually focuses on their own kinds. So maybe can there be a new um, practice uh, developing from the needs of society for more yeah. effective and unifying networks? Okay. Did, did you did you hear that fully, or do you want me to repeat that? Please repeat, because I got some. <laughs> okay. Uh, she's asking if there. Uh, if there is any new practices, new new uh, practice areas for game development in for the future, ah, generally outside of yeah. playful cities. Yeah. Um, well, so there's, I mean, there's two ways to answer this. One is there's always um, it. The analogy I'll use is when I talk to students who are new to game design. Uh, they kind of go, oh, every time I give them, every time they give me an idea or they give me a concept, I go, okay, cool. You should look at this game because it's been done similarly. And they start to get worried and nervous and like, oh man, I, I feel like there's nothing new to be had. And I remind them that every note has been played, every chord has been played, but that doesn't mean we stop creating new music, right? Um, and I think that that's part of it. So my first answer is uh, there's always something new to be done. Um, even in old genres and in old game types. Uh, the other is, I think there's a lot of opportunity that people skip uh, when new technologies get introduced. I'm frustrated, for example, that while um, smart devices like an Amazon Echo are extremely common, the innovations in uh, audio-only games or games that you can play while you cook or games you can play while you're driving have been really weak. There have been a couple of people who have taken Choose Your Adventures and made them audio. Um, but or they've made game shows where it's trivia, but there's so many other things we could be doing that I think would be kind of engaging and fun. 
Uh, so off the top of my head, that's, that's one area. I think there's loads of space to be done in playful cities. Um, there's lots of questions that we have unanswered in game design from an academic perspective about how to engage lots of people in public spaces. Uh, I had promoted a couple of years ago, a couple of um, domains and games that I think are super exciting, like this notion of interstitial games, games that are um, sort of you accidentally happen upon as you're walking through as civic engagements. Oh, did you notice if you walked over here and actually threw your trash away, you'd get a little reward. Um, and at the same time, I think there are uh, opportunities to do uh, what we call um, more games with a purpose. So basically games where you're doing a single activity that's actually affecting the real world. So it might be helping us to identify gene sequences. It might be doing things like helping us to understand anomalies and data or um, helping us solve problems like how to move people through a specific space, how to address traffic in an area um, through gameplay. Uh, we've done some of those. Uh, we created a game a couple of years ago that helped people understand how to program programmable uh, microchips, um, FPGAs, uh, and it was a game where you were basically driving traffic, but you were learning the language of um, programming programmable chips, uh, and we factitious work that way too, in that we were actually polling people, so I love the idea of games as polling systems. There's a ton out there. I, I probably spent an hour giving suggestions for domains in games that haven't quite been explored well, that we only have one or two examples of, and we could use hundreds more. Uh, but those are all the ones off the top of my head and particularly interesting to me. We have another question. Uh, Great. I repeat the question for you. Thank you. Uh, do we think that virtual reality will be the mainstream? I quite bluntly have not been a huge fan of the potential for VR. I think VR has a lot more uh, opportunity to engage a specific kind of gamer, a gamer who really wants to be immersed in their environment, but we recognize there are loads of people who want to spend five minutes swiping on their phones and then they want to move on. And we have other people who want to engage in something for five minutes before they go to bed and they may not want to don a headset. Uh, and as the hardware gets easier and lighter, uh, I think it'll, it will invite more people into it, but I do think we're a ways off before everyone's core game experience is a VR experience. Uh, and I think that's something we could have we could have observed a while ago. And I say this for perspective, um, my second grad degree came from the EVL, um, the Electronics Visualization Lab, which is the place that invented the CAVE VR system, which was sort of like the fundamental first generation easy um, VR setup. And I, my first games that I made as a grad student were VR games. Uh, and I found so much more engaging about the challenges in game mechanics fundamentally than I did in VR that I'm still, I still think we have a lot more problems to solve there than we do in making hyper-realistic experiences. Uh, but I do see the benefit. And I was a champion. If anyone's familiar with The Void, I thought The Void was going to be like the next big thing. Uh, and then they ran out of money. If you're unfamiliar with The Void, the short version is think of Giant Warehouse where we have extended reality uh, because we've actually been able to put things on the wall as you wear your VR headset and carry your VR gun that actually let you um, feel as though you're really in that world. You pick up torches, you do that sort of stuff. Um, and that seemed like a great step forward. But uh, financially unsustainable. Of course, the pandemic happened, which didn't help it, but um, yeah, I hope that's a quick overview of my thoughts on VR. Okay, that was all the questions, Lindsay. Uh, okay. You, uh, add anything? On top of that, or? No, no, if anybody has any questions, needs anything from me, I'm easy to reach. Um, yeah, happy to help if if any of this is, ho I hope this was a useful talk for you. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, just uh, one crazy guy's perspective. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you.